Let's pray together tonight. You can, you can remain seated. Father God, thank you so much. Thank you so much you've already spoken to us that we've said to ourselves, Lord, that we want to receive that ring. We want to receive that blessing. But tonight, Lord, nothing is so more, much more powerful than your word. The word gets into our hearts, divides the things that we have that think come from you from the things that are from you, comes in and works and restores and changes and corrects us. So many wonderful things, encourages. So tonight I pray that your word does that. Father, you can use anyone. But tonight I'm here and I'm available. And I ask that you would use me tonight to share the truth that you have for us today. And Lord, I ask a blessing over all the churches that are in the Inland Empire and around the world. Father, we have never, ever said that we're better than anybody, that we're the only ones. Lord, we've always said we are partners together with them, co laborers advancing one kingdom, and that's yours alone. So bless them also, Father. Expand your kingdom through them. They bring many believers and use many churches to reach those who are outside of your love tonight, Lord God. In Jesus' name, I ask for that. And we pray together, and the church says, amen, amen. All right. Tonight, I just want to share as a... Simple word that God gave me, but um, simple doesn't mean it's simplistic. It just means that it's there to help us, design us, help us in so many ways. Go to the book of Acts, chapter 26, and hang in there. We're going to be mostly really in the book of Acts and just um, see what God did with, this, um, with the Apostle Paul in particular. But um, it's such an interesting story that God spoke to me into my own life, and so I want to share that with you. I've shared a little bit of it, but he had place this message in my heart. I shared a little bit with our Spanish ministry a while back, but it was so such an impacting word for my heart. And um, just to put a title, I put begin again, begin again. And you know, for many of us, that is such an important thing for us to have, especially when you uh, come into the new year. And so you make new year resolutions, all these things happen. And so uh, right now by March, I would say maybe half of them are non-existent on your list by now, right? And you're like, well, I don't know what I said in January. I don't know what was going on. Too many Martinelli's. You don't get drunk from them just in case, just in case. But um, but, you know, you just, you're, you just moved on. You just, oh, man, what's going on? What am I doing with this or that? But a lot of times there's things in our life that we have to begin again. So the way it happened for me, I have a friend in Mexico who works in the prison system. And he is a chaplain, and he visits a lot of the prisons in Mexico. And so he told me, Pastor, I really want you to visit this prison that I've personally, not only the chaplain, but I've become the pastor of this church and uh, in Mexicali, and so, so I said, man, that would be great. Uh, my time is so taxed. I, I just couldn't get around there. Finally, around December of last year, we made the time. We put on the calendar. We said, we're going to show up. We're going to go, and we're going to bless this prison. I, I believe you saw the video. If you didn't, we donated some chairs because their chairs were literally falling apart. They have to stack three chairs, three broken chairs, to make one decent chair to sit on. And so we said, hey, so our church, you guys, through our mission fund, we donated chairs to them. Um, we brought them lunch. We brought them hot chocolate because it's super cold. And it was a great experience, but it was a very sobering experience. This was a, an enormous, enormous prison that advanced all kinds. It goes from uh, maximum security all the way to minimum security. And so we're ministering in the middle. Kind of these guys are halfway there. Most of, most of them drug offenses, things like that, um, that type of crime. But they were just, they were genuine guys. And so we went in there and it was such an amazing thing. He asked me to preach and I was just like, what do I tell guys who are doing real hard time? I mean, this is not a joke. These guys are there 15, 20, 30 plus years. And so here I am showing up. I, I barely have had a couple tickets in my life, you know, and it's just like, like, how do I even engage this, this kind of life? How do I connect with them? And so I felt inadequate, to be honest. I felt inadequate to, to share the gospel with them. But I just began to ask the Lord. I said, Lord, give me a genuine love for these guys. Let me, let me know what you have for them. And God began to work in my life. And he said, you know what? These guys, they need a, new, they need a do-over. They need a do-over in their life. And many of us need do-overs in areas of our life. Not a remodeling. See, a lot of people do a remodel. They kind of kind of put, you know, face, paint, different things. No, no, no. We need a do-over. We need to rebuild a lot of areas in our life. And beginning again is super important. Because we need to begin again in many areas of our life. And for these guys, that's what they needed. They needed an opportunity to begin again. Because at some point in their life, they blew it. At some point in their life, they did something, got involved in some ways that led them to be now in a prison and spend so many years of their life. Their worship leader was a young guy. I would say he was 
um, maybe late 20s, and he had already been here for 12 plus years. And I was just like, this is crazy. And he was so anointed. He was such a genuine kid. I was just like, Lord, I was so humbled, so humbled by this experience. And God brought me to the book of Acts to talk about a man that you and I know is very common, the Apostle Paul. And the Apostle Paul, out of his own lips, begins to share his own personal process with beginning again. He said, man, I had problems and I had to begin again. Let me frame you. Maybe some of you guys are, uh, you know, been in church a long time, so you guys kind of know the story of this. But the Apostle Paul was probably the best theological student of his school. He was the most solid of his division of philosophy and religion um, to the point that he was willing to kill in order to enforce that which he believed. And the Apostle Paul got involved in a lot of craziness, a lot of craziness, which he talks about it um, in the Gospels. And he got involved in so many things and derailed his life in a way because he was so zealous about what he believed, even though what he believed was wrong. And so he needed a do-over, and he needed an encounter with God in order to begin that do-over. He begins to share his own story in the book of Acts, chapter 26, and he says the following. He's about to be executed. So the Apostle Paul is in a trial before a judge, and he's telling the judge, Judge, I want you to hear my story before we conclude in anything you're about to do. And in Acts 26, he tells him, So I said... So the Apostle Paul says, hey, I was going to a certain city, a light appeared around me, I fell to the ground, I had an encounter and a conversation with God, and this is our conversation. And so I said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. So so here's Paul, has an encounter with God, and Jesus himself has to show up and said, hey, man, you're chasing me. You got to be careful who you're persecuting, not in a good way, not after God to get something good. But he was beating people up. He was persecuting Christians. He was going into their house, tearing their doors out and getting them out of their house, taking them to be killed for their belief. I mean, Paul was a bad, bad man. Uh, Verse 16 says, but but rise and stand on your feet. I love that. So he's going directly to the story. He says, but rise and stand on your feet. For I have appeared to you for this purpose, to make you a minister and a witness Uh, And a witness both of the things you have seen and the things which I will reveal to you. And I want to begin there because this is so interesting. Paul says, listen, God has spoken to me. And when he took a hold of me, he began by challenging me. And the first thing you see is exactly that. When I was talking to these men in the prison, I said, listen, we already know you messed up. That's why you're in here. And a lot of times for all of us is just the realization of saying, I've messed up. I screwed up a business venture. I screwed up my marriage. I screwed up my health. I made a mistake. I'm in the process. And so Paul has to come to a realization, I have to make an acknowledgement of my own ways. And so when I'm sharing with this, I, I, for all of us, this is very important because the hardest thing that we do is we deny And denial is not going to get you to where God wants you to be. Are you with me? So in the process of beginning again, the first thing God says to Paul is, hey, Paul, get up. He didn't say, Paul, I get you. I'm so sorry. He just said, Paul, arise. Get up. And many of us, that is exactly what we need. We have to get up. We have to focus in it. We have to hone in this process. We have to get the, the strength to get up and actually do it and go for it. And for many of us, we have to now start thinking, how do we do this? Do I stay in the sadness of the fact that my marriage was lost? Or do I stay in the sadness of the fact that I lost an investment or whatever it was? I have to get up and move up from that experience. I've I've been very open about this. I I think I've shared it here, but I've shared it plenty of times in our Spanish ministry. But um, many years ago when the economy came down, um, I think I shared with you, but it was was interesting for me. Um, many Many of you guys maybe went through this, but we lost our home. We had to short sell it. It wasn't repossessed, but we had to short sell it. And it was a bummer. You know, it was like, oh, man, this stuff stinks. I didn't want to do that. I, I tried all kinds of angles to maintain it. This was many years ago. Uh, we were talking about 10 years ago when this happened, um, 2008. And, uh, and so I looked at all the angles, trying to maintain this and do that, and it just did not work out for a family. And as the man of the house, that was hard for me. That was like, 
frustrating. And so the thing is that we love our neighborhood so much. And we love the street we live on. Our kids grew up there. We knew the neighbors. And so we were praying, Lord, help us, you know, to do this. And one day um, we are, my wife and I are going out to go see some other houses around here, around Loma Linda, kind of to stay close to church. And uh, the neighbor across the street is moving out. So we're like... Oh, that's, that's pretty interesting, you know? So we go. We know the owner. We know the owner because we all bought at the same time. But he had moved to Orange County to, with his business. And so we call the owner and say, hey, how you doing? It's us. We live across the street. We short sell our home. He's like, oh, man, absolutely. You guys, it's your house. He's super cool. He's like, they move out in a couple days. You guys move in. You guys will take care of it. So Because we knew him. So it worked out really well. So when we were moving, it looked like we were stealing stuff because we were walking one thing from one house and walking across the street to the other. Uh, somebody took a picture of that, but yes, that was, that was brutal. Um, but we didn't steal anything. It just looked that way. Um, and so, but then a few days go by after we move into this house, and every time I go out to my car to come to church and do whatever, I'm looking at the house I lost. And it was such a painful reminder. Like, I had to pray about it. Like, Lord, this is crazy. Every time I open my door, I'm staring at my mistake. And I remember the Lord just having to speak to me about not measuring myself based on the things we've lost or the things that we've seen in our lives. And so we need to get up. And we need to move on. And we need to look at life and say, you know what? Yes, it happened. I acknowledge it. But God has better things for my life. And that is exactly what he told Paul. He said, Paul, you got to get up. I get it. You're being persecuting me. I got you good. But arise. Get up. I was watching a story online that I want you to see this video. And this video is incredible. You've probably seen it. But I wanted to share with you. And this is the video about a girl let me just make sure I say her name right. I'll probably butcher her name anyways. But um, about this girl, her name is Heather. Heather Dorden, I think is her name. And um, this girl was amazing. This girl was a runner. Um, she had won a bunch of um, different prices and different things in college and in, in, in the U.S. and running the mile, the half a mile. She was amazing. She was an incredible runner. But something happened to her in her last qualifying run or in her, really in her victory run, to say the, of that, of college NCAA tournament. But I want you to see what happens. Pay attention to this video. The 600 meter underway. Heather Dorner to Minnesota finished second this event a year ago. She was in lane four. And Dornan is probably going to be your favorite. She actually won the NCAA championships in 2006 in the 800, but she only won one Big Ten championship in the two years. Three laps. In this event, 600 meters, three times around the 200 meter track here at the field house. What a bold move by Fallon. She's looking very confident, and the Penn State runner is just running amazing today. She did win her heat in the 400, but ended up taking fourth overall. That's Fawn Dorr moving into the lead, a sophomore from Penn State. Dornan running second. Dornan last year scored 23 points for the Golden Gophers in their Big Ten Championship. So they're really relying on getting a lot of points from her this weekend. And she's just coming by Fondor now in the home stretch, heading into the bell lap. Oh, 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 oh. Dornan and falling down gets up quickly, but that's going to cost her. Lucky she wasn't injured. Her teammate just went to the front, though, so they may be able to recover from that. And Dornan is flying down the back stretch. She is catching is, up. She is going to catch Fondor, and she may catch the leader. Wow. Wow. She's got fun. This is a gutsy effort by Dornan. Can she pull it off? She's moved into third. Dornan coming down the stretch from the outside. Dornan coming out strong. Dornan all the way. Dornan. Yes. Oh, yes. She did it. Wow. Wow. Unbelievable. <laughs> that is amazing. I think I must have cried like every time I saw that video in my office. I was just like, this is crazy. This video has been viewed more than, by th more than 30 million times on YouTube. If you combine all the different versions of this video. This is so inspirational. This girl, she had prepared. She had done everything just like Paul. She was the best in her realm. She had invested so much time. She's done everything to win. Everything. As she's running, she loses it. How many of us have done everything we could have in our own life and then we lose it? 
Many of us have. We made the investment. We've loved in our life. We've made the, the correct here and there. We believe the numbers added up and things did not add up. And this girl was so amazing. She got up and she just ran the race. In her head, when they interviewed her, said, in her head, I knew I was going to win the race, so I just got up and kept on running until I actually did. And for many of us, that is exactly what it is. On God, with God on our side, we have got to change the way we're looking at our situation, and we have to get up. If anything else, we have to do that. Look what the Bible says about you and me in the book of Isaiah. In the book of Isaiah, it says this in the New, in, uh, International Version, a very famous verse, verse 1 and 2 of Isaiah 6. He says, Arise and shine for your light has come and the glory of the Lord rises upon you. Verse two, see darkness covers the earth and thick dark darkness is over the peoples, but the Lord rises upon you and his glory appears over you. I love this verse for one reason alone, because the God of the Bible never denies that there is darkness. Bible could say your light has shined, there's glory all around you, the clear, the way, it's phenomenal. It doesn't say that. Verse 2 says, there's thick darkness. But I want you to know that above you, there's glory and there's something good happening on your behalf. And for many of us, we have to get that mindset in our life. The same as Paul. So get up. So look at your situation and get up. Number two, God wants us to look at something very important. He wants us to accept our calling. Accept your calling. We have to just say, This is what I was made for. I mean, this girl thought to herself, I'm a runner. So I know I fell, but I'm a runner. I'm going to go for it. I'm going to chase after that which I've trained so hard for. And for many of us, that is something we have to do. We just have to accept our calling. Let me tell you, um, I don't know how many times I've second-guessed myself as a pastor. You know, this and that, and situations happen, and you kind of are thinking, well, is this the right thing? Is this what I'm supposed to do? I have to go back to God who told me to get up and do something. And so when I accept that which God is giving me, I change the way I think. Here's here's Paul. Here's how he was thinking. He comes and says in verse 16, says, but arise and stand to your feet. This is the word of the Lord to Paul. Arise and stand to your feet because he fell, he was blinded, and the Lord says, get up. So get up, Paul. I have appeared to you for this purpose. Can you say this purpose? purpose. I have appeared to you for this purpose, to make you a minister and a witness, both to the things which, I've, which you have seen and the things what I'm about to reveal to you. So this is so crucial that we, we believe that God has called us to do something and that we accept that. And, and God told him, arise, Paul. I've called you for that particular purpose. We say an expression here that we all are full-time ministers of the gospel. And that is exactly a reality. You know what's interesting? That the word minister is actually the word servant. It's actually the word servant. And so he's saying, you guys are here to serve. All of us are here to serve one another, serve the goodness of God, serve the things that God put in our lives. And we have to use that and just accept that that is what God has called us to do. And it will be transformation in your life, transformational, because it's so important that we, are, that we stay open to that. You just never know how you're going to minister or reach somebody. I'm not sure, you know, when, when you make when you make. Sorry, when you're talking all the time like we do as preachers, you say a lot of things. And um, I don't know if I've shared this story with you, but I, last year I went to Nicaragua. And uh, in one of my flights, my setup flight, I came back and I sat between two, a couple that didn't want to sit together. That was awkward. Uh, and so I got the middle seat, and I'm thinking, oh, husband and wife, so she'll scoot over, and I'll get the window of the aisle. I'm like, yes. And he's like, nah, we've been flying for like 19 hours. We just want to sit separate. So you sit in the middle. I'm like, okay. So, so I'm sitting there in the seat, and then she's here, he's here, and she's looking at her iPad. He's reading a book. I'm just like, all right, man, I'll just, you know, I'll just focus. I'm just sitting there and keep my focus. And so as we're landing into LAX, we just strike up a conversation, start talking about different things and this and that. What do you guys do? Oh, we're traveling. They're retired. We're getting to know the world. We're, you know, getting to know whatever. They were in a spiritual journey. Obviously, I come from India, so I share. So he asked me the question that always gets a very big silence. Ask any person. So what do you do? I'm a pastor. Cricket, cricket. I mean, the conversation ended the moment I dropped the word, you know. But then, then he asked me, so what do you guys do? I share, oh, we do this. My wife and I Spanish ministry. We have a, a beautiful feeding program. We help the people in our area. And he says something that I'll never forget. Because I could have said a lot of things, but he didn't mention one thing that I said. He just said, I can tell you have something different in you because the way you smile. 
Now, I didn't feel like smiling. We had been flying red-eye flight. I was tired. I didn't want to sit between a husband and a wife that didn't want to sit together. I was awkward. I'm huge, so I'm literally sitting like this the whole time for five and a half hours. But he said something that caught my attention. He didn't hear a word of what I said, that I was a minister, that we're feeding people, and though that's great. He said, I like the way you smile. And when you accept what God has put in your life, even that can reach somebody. The way you smile, the way you help them, the way you did something, the way you stretched out your hand. And we have to stay focused and open to what God wants to do in us and through us. Because we, in the end, we are servant. And God told Paul, I appear to you for this purpose. Let me tell you something. God did not show up in your life to leave you the way you are. Period. There is a point and a purpose to this. If you're going to clap, just give it to him. He deserves it. And it's for him. He's got something in your life. Number three, number three, very important. Num number three, very important. Get up, find the purpose that has called you. Number three, prepare. I read an expression. You probably have heard this expression many times that says that luck is what happens when preparation meets opportunity. Yeah. Luck is what happens when preparation meets opportunity. That is so crucial because a lot of people want opportunity, but they're not prepared yet. One of my favorite shows, actually my family's favorite show is Shark Tank. I don't know if you've ever seen the show, but, you know, we watch it all the time. And so I always tell my kids, I'm like, I want to retire early, so get to invent something. Come on, let's go. Um, and so, so we're talking, and, uh, and we watch the show because it's such an interesting show. So many people taking great risks um, and doing great things and inventing and doing uh, amazing things. But it's so interesting that a lot of people, the main thing that derails, I was watching a, uh, behind the scenes, is actually what derails them is the pitch. So when you go and your pitch about your product is not correct, most of the time you don't get a deal. And you know what that is? Preparation. Simple as that. Preparation. Here's the opportunity they've been waiting for. They work night and day. They work in the garages. They build. They sew. They borrow money from grandpa, neighbor, from everybody, from the person they hate. They took money from that guy too. You know, they just did everything they could to begin a business, right? When it's time for the opportunity, they blow it because they weren't prepared to meet their opportunity. And many of us, that is the one element for many Christians that a lot of times we have to be ready. We have to continue doing that. Whether it's Bible college, growing in your life, growing in your business, doing the little things that would prepare you and catapult you to be better. God is telling you, keep preparing, keep working, keep going, keep doing. You know how we pray today? That the seeds that we've sown will come back to bless us in a greater way. That's preparation. That is continuing to do the things that may seem kind of dumb at times, kind of frustrating at times, but those things are getting you ready for the proper opportunity. You never know when that opportunity is going to come. Here's what the Apostle Paul, uh, Jesus told him. He said, I will deliver you. I love this. I love this. Verse 17. Verse 17 says, I will deliver you from the Jewish people as well as from the Gentiles to whom I now send you. Let's translate this because this gets even better in Acts 22. Basically, Paul was saying, Look, man, where you were at, those people want to kill you. And where I'm sending you, they want you dead too. But I'm preparing them and I'm working on you. That, who wants that ministry? And, and in the book of Galatians, the apostle Paul says that he took, listen, listen, he says, it took 14 years. From the time he's telling us a story that God revealed to him. To the time he actually went out and began a large ministry, went up to Jerusalem to confirm his calling. Paul says in Galatians, 14 years had passed. Now, we're all impressed with the Apostle Paul. We're all blown away with what he's done. But we have to also see the time that got worked in. What was God working in this guy? God had to mold this person. Paul was a rebellious dude. Paul was a hothead. I mean, Paul was like... You know, an usher in a church, and he would just blow you. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Um, so Paul was odd. He was, he was complicated. Look what he says in New Living Translation in Acts chapter 22, verse 18. I saw a vision. He's telling this story again, his conversion story. He said, I saw a vision of Jesus saying to me, hurry, leave Jerusalem, for the people here won't accept your testimony about me. They won't. And this is why. Because Paul was fresh. Paul had just given their hearts to the Lord. And many times, for all of us, if you're a new Christian, man, you want to go back because you found something so wonderful. And your buddies are like, man, don't, don't be doing Jesus to me. I mean, you and I did some stuff just three days ago. So relax. 
right? Don't raise your hand, but you know it's true. And so all of us have been in that position where we found Jesus with something good, and we want to tell him, and we have to because that's part of what God wants to do in Paul. But people need time to see the process of the Lord in you. And so this takes time, but you have to embrace it. As God prepares, it's going to be amazing what he's built for you. But it takes time. Look what he continues to say. Verse 19. He says, but the Lord, but Lord, I argue. Paul said, but Lord, I argue. They certainly know that in every synagogue, I imprisoned and beat those who believed in you. Next verse, verse 9, 20. And I was a complete, I was in complete agreement when your witness, Stephen, was killed. I stood by and kept the coats that they took off of, off of them as they stoned him. Now, now, this is crazy. Paul is admitting to second degree murder. Those who watch, you know, crying, law, all those movies, you guys understand what I'm talking about. Paul just said, Lord, let me preach to them. They'll see how wonderful, because they know I was terrible. They know I stood there as everybody killed this guy and said nothing. As a matter of fact, I kept their clothes so they didn't get drenched in blood. So if you think you've done bad, nah. Paul was on another level. Yet God used him mightily. Because Paul embraced exactly what God wanted to do, a new beginning. And for many of us, God wants to do something great in your life, but you have to embrace a new beginning. And a new beginning begins to know, to say, you know, I've done some stupid stuff, Lord, but I'm ready for a new beginning. I'm ready for a transformation. I'm ready to embrace a preparation that you can bring into my life. Look at this, verse 21. Verse 21 says, but the Lord said to me, but the Lord said, so Paul is arguing with the Lord, saying, don't preach it. And Paul's saying, let me at it, Lord. They know I was terrible, but I'm different now. Verse 21, but the Lord said to me, go, for I will send you far away to the Gentiles. In other words, the Lord says, get out of San Bernardino, go somewhere else, cool off, get training, come back. Because God wants to do these things. And these things are done in that time of preparation where he works in your heart. He works in your habits. He works in every area of your life. But it all begins with you embracing that in your life. Here's the last thing. Here's the last thing that God wants to bring to your life and my life in this process. And is this. Once God has done that, you got to share what you have. you got to share what you have. This is very people for nowadays to see good news. Because the whole system is designed for bad news. I mean, I, I'm a news junkie. I enjoy it personally, but there's some days where I can't have it because there's nothing good happening, nothing good. You think, man, when I open the door, my car's going to burn, my neighbor's dead, the dog is going to bite me. I mean, you think something's coming your way, yes or no? I mean, we're all, it's like this stuff is crazy. Everything you see is negative. The stock market is high through the roof, but you know what? Then everybody's getting sick with the flu. Now we're getting a hold of the flu, but then uh, the nor'eastern is drowning people and killing everybody on the north. I mean, it's just like it doesn't stop. And so when we focus just on that, we don't see the good thing that God is doing. And you know what? It happens in churches also. Because the devil is especially is magnifying what is bad. He is so great at that. And so somebody would bring me bad news about the church today. Um, it didn't happen today, a few days ago. And so today I'm greeting out the door at the end of Spanish service. And it was so wonderful. Everybody came up to me, Pastor, let me tell you a testimony. Pastor, let me share you. And I left so encouraged in the Lord that the Lord is doing good things, even though some people only see the bad things that are happening. Are you with me? And so in our lives, we have to look at what is the good thing God is doing? What are the things he's doing in our lives for transformation, for preparation, for everything he's doing? And the Apostle Paul was getting us exactly that, that we share those things that are good in our life. Look at what he says, verse 17 and 18. He says, I'm going to send you to the Gentiles. Verse 18, look at this. This is our calling to open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light. That's your calling. That's my calling. To turn them from darkness to light. And from the power of Satan to the power of what? Of God. To the power of God. That's our calling. That they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. What an amazing calling the Lord put on Paul and the Lord pulls on us. So when I'm talking to these men back to the prison in Mexico, 
I told him, I said, guys, here's the reality the Lord wants for you. You're going to have to get up. You're going to have to acknowledge that you did some dumb stuff. But God is preparing you for something incredible. And you have to embrace that while you're in here, God has called you to be a light and a transformative uh, power in everything you do. And it was such an encouraging word because when we started praying, man, these guys got on their knees and they're asking the Lord to use them in a great mighty way. There was probably about 60, 70 guys in the small chapel in a prison. But they were so wanting the Lord to use them in a great and mighty way. I was so encouraged by that because they're in a way that they have no choice. But you and I, we have a choice. We have a choice to absolutely get up, begin again, put the effort for transformation and do something about it in our lives. And you know what the key is? Paul tells us the key. Next verse. And Paul says, Therefore, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. There's one version that says, Paul says, I was not rebellious to the heavenly vision. Vision. You know what's the main problem? Rebellion. The main problem is, I know better I can do it better. I know how to do it. And so when I'm talking to these men and I'm talking to you today, here's what Paul is telling all of us. If God gave you a vision and he's leading you in a certain way, don't be disobedient. If he's working in your heart in a particular area, don't be rebellious. But instead, open up your arm and say, Lord, we'll do it your way. I'll receive your direction. I'm going to get up. I'm going to focus in whatever you have me do in this walk that you have me going. And that, my friends, that would absolutely transform everything in your life this very day. See, as pastors, we talk to people all the time. Pastor, I'm going through this. I'm going through that. And all that as well. But for most of us, we have to begin again. Many of you guys, not all of us, tonight we have to go and hit the button, the reset button of our life. Whatever situation it may be, you might need to say, you know what, Lord, I've tried this, i tried that. I need to now focus in what you want for me because he wants you to begin again. He doesn't want you to feel like I felt many years ago. Every time I opened my front door, I saw what I lost. Instead, God wants me to see every time I open my front door, I'm stepping into the world for a new opportunity. I'm stepping into the day to find something new, something better, something great. So every time you open the door of your life, don't say, man, I'm not sure that I want to open to this relationship because that one and that one fail. You never know if God is speaking to you in a particular area. I don't want to begin this business because I made this investment and that investment. Maybe you got to do it a different way, but open the door to something new because we have to begin again. Otherwise, we will sit in frustration for the rest of our life. Paul was blinded. Paul lost it all. Paul had to begin again. But man, when he did, we're all now talking about the guy because he made the greatest investment you can ever make, which is your entire life to God, dedicated to him, for him to use you in a great way. So if anybody tonight needs to begin again, I am asking you today that which Paul taught us today, which is you got to get up. You're going to have to refocus. You're going to have to put some preparation in it. And once you have it, just open up and share whatever God has done in your life. God spoke to you today. Let him know. Mm-mm. <clears throat>